Hello and welcome to the Soul Freedom Show. This is your host Lokesh Baba. Our website is soulfreedom.org and uh, we are on YouTube live right now. Our special guest today is Mr. Martin W. Ball. Martin is a writer, independent publisher, energy worker, visionary artist and musician. He currently lives in Ashland, Oregon. In the spring of 2009, Martin underwent a, a profound energetic opening and transformation, the result of intensive work with entheogenic medicines and a year of profound self-exploration. The result is Martin's articulation of what he calls the entheo entheological paradigm, a grand unified theory of all reality from God to direct experience of each human being, which he characterizes as an articulation of his view on radical non-duality. His approach is unique in that he sees the tension between duality and non-duality not as a spiritual or religious issue, but as an energetic issue that can be addressed through the intentional use of powerful entheogens such as 5-MeO-DMT. And Martin has also written a number of books and he also has a podcast, regular podcast where he interviews a lot of the people in this field. And his website is uh, martinball.net and also entheogenic.photomatic.com. And without further ado, I welcome my special guest, Martin Ball. Hi, Martin. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, great. It's nice to have you. So how's your day going? And why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself, Martin? Okay. Well, my day is going fine. A um, little bit tired, a little worn out today. I had a gig last night, so I, I never sleep very well after a gig because I, I tend to lie in bed and I think about all the songs. And um, So a little bit tired, and it's always physically a little bit draining, especially playing a lot of didgeridoo. But uh, other than that, it's been a good day, enjoying my Sunday, kind of wrapping up summer here. Um, yeah, so that's my day. Well, what can I tell you about myself? What would you like to know? Where to start? Because it's kind of a big question. Yeah, let's say how you got started uh, in this uh, huge field of entheogenics and what we call like spiritual evolution, let's say. Okay. Well, in many respects, these are kind of questions and things that I was interested in even as a small child. Um, Kind of in telling my own autobiography, I sort of identify back in high school uh, initially when I first learned that there was a profession called philosophy, for example. that I, I didn't know philosophy existed and then we had a class and we started reading some philosophers and I found out that that was still a profession. I guess, I mean, I knew about philosophy but I thought, oh, people did that a long time ago, like back in ancient Greece or something like that. People were philosophers then and I didn't realize that you could go and get a degree in philosophy and that there were still active philosophers. So, you know, I became interested in pursuing, you know, paths to knowledge, I guess, would be the best way to explain it. And as an undergraduate student, I got involved in physics and then also got involved in philosophy and eventually decided to not go into physics, but that was kind of a toss-up for me of either going into philosophy or go into physics. And then the more I got into philosophy, the more I found the limitations within philosophy, particularly because uh, if you go to a philosophy department, you're only really learning what can be called Western philosophy. You're not learning about, say, for example, philosophy from India or anywhere else. You're just learning about Western philosophy from Greece and from Europe and from the United States. So I started to get more and more interested in taking classes in religious studies as an undergraduate. So I ended up getting my degree. Um, my, my major was philosophy. My minor was religious studies. And then I went on to graduate school to get my master's and my PhD. And there I ended up pursuing a degree in religious studies. And um, it was also in this time period between college and graduate school that I first experienced psilocybin mushrooms. And from those experiences, I uh, became very interested in what is kind of generically called shamanism or visionary states of consciousness and became interested in mysticism, particularly comparative mysticism, looking at mystical experiences across different traditions and among different practitioners. 
Mm -hmm. um, ended up actually focusing on Native American traditions for both my master's and my PhD. So that's, that's kind of my primary area within religious studies. Um, I had been kind of simultaneously been pursuing um, Native American religions and also Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy, but there came a point in graduate school where I was learning Sanskrit and then I was also trying to teach myself um, the Navajo language simultaneously. And I just decided that that was just a little bit nuts. So I ended up dropping the Sanskrit and then just pursuing the Navajo and then working on uh, my Native American religions uh, rather than really pursuing also a degree in, say, Buddhism and Buddhist philosophy. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, boy, I graduated. I finished my PhD back in 2000, so that was a while ago. Uh, but that's how I got into the area. I mean, if you want to know more about any of that, I can expand. You start with in the beginning. Okay, I'm going to need you to repeat that. You're a little bit frozen on this end. Oh, uh, I was asking about the plants. Which plants, medicine, did you start out with? And what were your experiences in the beginning with Okay, you froze up a little bit at the end there, but I think I got you. Um, well, certainly the first plant that I ever experimented with was marijuana. Um, so on my 14th birthday, it was the first time I ever smoked pot. And in a sense, that kind of radicalized me um, from that very first experience of, of smoking marijuana because I had such a great time. I thought it was just fantastic. And at that point, I had had some experiences with alcohol, which I never really enjoyed very much. Um, mm -hmm. And the first time I experienced marijuana, I, you know, like many people, I instantly came to the conclusion that everything I had ever been told about marijuana was a lie, that none of it was accurate or genuine, that it was all pretty much a propaganda campaign to tell you that this plant and the experience associated with it was bad and that it was going to turn you into a dropout or whatever whatever it was that they were telling us back then. This was during the Nancy Reagan just say no era. Yeah. You know, users are losers and those kinds of motifs. Right. Um, so like many people, you know, when I tried pot, it's like, well, this is one of the greatest things I've ever experienced and I feel creative, I want to make music, I want to make art, I'm interested in ideas, yeah. I'm thinking in ways that I haven't thought before and it just opened up just so much for mm -hmm. me and it also helped me to understand aspects of spirituality. Um, mm -hmm. So I felt that marijuana really opened my eyes and at that point as a teenager I kind of became an activist actually just the other day I had some friends here in southern Oregon that they've opened up a medical marijuana dispensary in a local mm -hmm. town a town of talent and I was over there and I was really quite overwhelmed I was sitting in my car out in front of Green Valley Wellness in Talent Oregon and I was looking at their sign and I just started to cry as I'm sitting there in the car and the reason for that is because when I was 14 and I first experienced marijuana and I became an advocate for legalization of marijuana as medicine and for recreation and for all the myriad other uses of marijuana and at that point I never thought I would see this day I would never thought that I'd be able to go to a friend's store mm -hmm. where they openly have marijuana plants and clones. They're out on the counter, and then they have their jars of pot out there, and you can go in, you can show your card, and you can buy it, and you can walk out, and it's all legal. No one's getting arrested. No one's getting harassed. No one's getting their property confiscated and their lives ruined. And, in fact, it's benefiting the community. It's benefiting society. And so I just started to cry because I was so overwhelmed. I was so happy that this day is actually here, that we're seeing the legalization of marijuana, uh, most likely this year in Oregon. There's there's a vote that's coming up. So we'll probably be the mm -hmm. third state in the United States to legalize it for recreational use. It's been legal here as uh, medicine for many years, just like it has in California. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's really where things started, was experimenting with marijuana and I'd go over to friends' houses and we'd smoke and mostly we'd sit around and we'd make music. We'd just jam for hours and we'd put lots of effects on the guitars and on the microphones. And so it was kind of goofy. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, for me, that it was just, it was great because I always felt artistically inspired. I always felt energetically inspired and opened up um, in my experiences with, with marijuana versus drinking alcohol. I felt profoundly stupid. Whenever I drank alcohol, yeah. it just felt uh. <laughs> like I feel so dumb and just observing <laughs> other people just yeah. do really dumb things. Yeah. People getting into fights, um, mm -hmm. just making asses of themselves. And so really early on as a teenager, I decided, well, I, I like these plant things. I'm not so into alcohol or anything like that in terms of altering my consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until college that I first experienced psilocybin mushrooms. And the first experience I had with psilocybin mushrooms was, like many people, I was actually at a festival, out at a concert, like this weekend event in Northern California called Gathering of the Vibes. Mm -hmm. And the mushrooms actually weren't very strong. So for me, that very first experience was along the lines of, wow, this is weird. I feel really strange, not quite sure what's happening. Um, and so something that I learned from working with mushrooms is that personally I found that I enjoyed stronger mushroom experiences more than weak mushroom experiences because the stronger it gets, just the more immersive it becomes. Mm -hmm. And then for me, the clearer the experience was in terms of what I was getting out of it, what, what I was going through. Mm -hmm. um, and what I was learning, whereas it, with sort of the weaker mushroom experience, it was just, wow, I feel really weird, and I'm not sure what's going on. Um, so for me, stronger, I learned pretty early on, uh, worked better for me. Mm -hmm. um, so then for many years, those really were the two things that I had experience with, would be marijuana and psilocybin mushrooms. And then in 2001... That was my first trip to Burning Man, and I had acquired some salvia divinorum uh, for that first venture out to the playa. Mm -hmm. And so the, towards the end of that very first Burning Man that I went to, that was my first experience with salvia divinorum and found that I absolutely loved salvia divinorum mm -hmm. uh, based on that first experience. Um, it was just tremendously powerful, tremendously overwhelming, and... I was just ecstatic. I loved it. It is interesting because I found that actually many people do not like salvia divinorum because it really frightens them. But for me, my reaction was just, ah, oh, this is this is fantastic. So I really yeah. love it. It's kind of interesting because that's one theme that's true with all entheogenics is that it's different people react differently. So you cannot say, okay, this is your pill and take it and you'll be all done. <laughs> yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to try out different things, I guess, to see what works with you, right? Yeah, and that's also a reason that you know a lot of people contact me asking about different medicines and things like that, and a lot of times they're approaching me saying, "Well, I'm really interested in trying this, but I've been reading these trip reports online or something like that." And my advice to people usually is just stay away from trip reports. Right. That it will tend to give you a very slanted and very distorted view of what any medicine does based on what people post online. Because people want to post their big dramatic experiences. Maybe they're really positive or maybe they're just really weird. Um, mm. But I think that they don't really give a very accurate representation of what's possible with the medicine. And of course, whatever any medicine, all that it's ever going to do is amplify your state in that moment. So if you're anxious, mm -hmm. it can make you more anxious. Yeah. If you're feeling relaxed, it can help you reach levels of relaxation that you've never imagined possible. If you're worried about something, it's going to bring up that content within the experience. So it's always a reflection of you. And so all these trip reports that are online, it's just a reflection of that person in that moment with yeah, that experience. Right. And you're not, not, yeah. Nobody else is going to get exactly the same thing. No, no. And, you know, the more you work with any medicine, the more variable you find that they can be. Now, every medicine, I would say, has its own sort of energetic signature. So for me, if any time I take mushrooms, it's okay, this is very clearly mushrooms. You, it looks like mushrooms, it feels like mushrooms, it tastes like mushrooms, it has that mushroom vibe to it. And then also within the whole tryptamine family, for me, 
Um, all the tryptamines are very similar. They all have their own unique presentations, but they're also all very clearly tryptamines. And then when you go to something like Salvia divinorum, the presentation is completely different. It's not anything like a tryptamine because it's not within the tryptamine family. It's its own unique molecule that they're, it's not related to any other visionary substance um, out there. So it's, it's very different. Um, so they, even though they have their own signature, the experiences can be widely varying. Um, you know, one, one experience can be beatific and the next one can be horrendous and, and horrifying. Because, it, again, it's always a reflection of you in that moment and what you're choosing to allow yourself to experience and what you're presenting to yourself and how yeah. you're either reacting to that or surrendering to that. So, yeah, when people say, you know, people using these uh, substances or psychedelics for just to have fun, it's not true. It's not, you know, you're not always going to have fun, right? Uh, so, you, it's like you never know what you're going to expect because if you knew what's going to happen, then, then there's no point of having it, right? Is that how it works? Well, that's certainly the way that it works for, for many people, that the novelty of the experience is part of what draws people to it, that there's an excitement about that, that, you know, in the same way that people want to try new things or you want to travel to some place that you've never been to before, or if you're looking at a mountain range and you, you think to yourself, gee, I wonder what's on the other side of that mountain range, or what's down that canyon, or if I go into this cave, I wonder what I'm going to find in there, and within that, we have opportunities to confront aspects of ourselves, our own assumptions, our beliefs, our attachments, our fears. And so, you know, that's why we use this term of the trip or the journey, that something that unfolds. And kind of like getting on an airplane, that once you've consumed an entheogen, you're on for the duration of the flight. That you don't, you don't get to say, oh, I don't like this anymore, I'm just going to get off, I'm going to jump out of the plane, that yeah. you know, you're in for the long haul. And so yeah. that's something that people just, need to understand. Now yeah. within that, there's mm -hmm. always flexibility. People can obsess about things, people can lock their minds onto certain ideas or experiences, people can project, they can form attachments. So there's all different kinds of ways that people can kind of bury themselves into a psychedelic pit. And you can always choose to change your mind. So if you're thinking about something that's terrifying you, you can always choose to think about something else if you want. But the medicine is still working. The medicine is still acting. So you can't stop the experience. But within that, you can, you can change your environment. You can change what you're thinking about. You can change your experience. So there's some things that you can vary, and then there's other aspects that you can't vary, that you just need to surrender to. Right. Uh, and what do you say about... Uh, the fact that it lets you uh, access your subconscious mind in the sense that when we dream at night, when we sleep, uh, are we going through the same kind of uh, dimension or, uh, you know, phase where we can access our subconscious mind? Is that what the entheogenics are letting you do? Well... I think that that's probably an accurate way of describing some of what occurs. It's certainly not everything, but the way that I like to talk about entheogens and what it is that they're really doing is, first of all, I would describe them as energetic amplifiers, that they're amplifying whatever's going on energetically with you. And when I'm talking about energy, I'm talking about your thoughts, I'm talking about your emotions. I'm also talking about your gestures, your habits of, of the ways that you use your body, the ways that you express yourself, your tone of voice. All of these things are reflections of your own energy and how you have constructed a, a sense of self. And so energetically, the ego is just a collection of different patterns of energy, of ways that we've chosen to construct our sense of self. Now, many of these choices that we've made about who it is that we think we are, how we're choosing to express ourselves or not express ourselves, how we choose to edit ourselves or to be honest or to be genuine, many of these are choices that we make starting when we're, we're very small children. So by the time we're adults, 
and experimenting with entheogens. A lot of this stuff has become so ingrained, so habitual, that it's largely unconscious or subconscious, that we're not really aware. You know, and pe people can, I'm sure, can easily identify these kinds of things where they say, I don't know why I always do X, Y, or Z, but whenever this happens, I always react this way. Or, you know, I, I self-defeat myself by doing these things. Or whenever someone asks me how I feel, I never tell them the truth. I tell them something else. So there, there's, you know, we can all identify ways in which we can see that there are patterns that are running us, but maybe we don't know why. So when we're working with entheogens, they're amplifying the energy of our being. And anywhere there's a kink in our energy or where there's a knot in our energy, whether it's our emotions, it's our thoughts, it's our self-expression, whatever that may be, the energy of the entheogen can help to bring it to the surface, which is why it can become such a powerful therapeutic tool, far more powerful than, say, going to a therapist and sitting around and talking about your issues. Um, in my experience, most people in talking about their issues, they're not really aware of what the core of the issue is. So they kind of dance around, well, here's all this surface stuff that's related, but what's the root? What's, what's at the core of that issue? And entheogens help to bring these more core, these deeper issues to the surface that it can allow people to process it, to recognize it, to own it, to become aware that this is a pattern that I'm involved in. And then, once you become aware of a pattern, you can choose to release that pattern and you can choose to let yourself go of that or to form a new pattern or to make adjustments. So through amplified self-awareness, we become more authentic. We become more ourselves through the action of entheogens. If they're used in that way, and it, they're not going to force that on you because, again, it's just it's an amplification of you so if you choose to be completely ignorant of yourself, you can do that. Now, the medicines are going to throw a lot of stuff at you, but you can always choose to ignore that if you want. Right. So that's where probably the intention comes in before you go into these journeys, like uh, maybe thinking about what you want out of it. Is that a good idea, or what's the best way to start the journey? Well... In a sense, it depends on what you're looking for. Now, if someone's using entheogens in what I would call just a, a clinical, say, therapeutic use, for example, um, you know, there's lots of studies being done now looking at how various entheogens might be used as an adjunct to traditional therapy or psychiatry and things like that. Um, so... In, in that case, let's say someone has an issue, they have a relationship issue, and maybe they want to address that. Entheogens are a possible tool for doing that. So then you can set your intentions that, look, I'm going into this because I want to get clear about my relationship with my partner or with my parents or with my children or whatever it is that I'm having these issues, and this is something that I want to address. And that can be useful. It doesn't mean that that's necessarily what you're going to get out of the experience because you get what you're actually prepared for and what you really need, not necessarily what you want. So you might think, well, I need to work on re my relationship with my wife, and then you go in and it's all about your mother, and you think, whoa, that was weird. You get some kind of Freudian trip about it. Like, uh, I wanted to, wanted to get clear on my relationship with my wife, and it was all my mother. I don't know what's going on. But you get it helps you identify what's really going on there. So in that sense, setting an intention can be useful. I do think that there are limitations to that because most people are setting intentions from the perspective of their ego, and most egos are terribly confused, and they don't really know what's going on. They don't really understand what the actual issue is. So at times that can kind of distort the process for someone, especially if they become very attached to what they think that intention is or what they think that purpose is. If their ego gets locked onto it and says, no, I don't want to see about my mother. I don't want to deal with my mother. I only want to have experiences related to my wife. Then that's going to create a distortion within that experience and probably will create some kind of struggle 
within the person. Um, what I see is setting the best intention. Now, if you really want to maximize your entheogenic experience, my advice for setting your intention is do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And if you can go into the experience with the attitude of, well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to do absolutely nothing. So that's the Buddhist way of, like, no mind? <laughs> it, in a sense, that would be a, sort of a more Buddhist approach of I'm not going into this to try and achieve something or reach some kind of resolution. I'm just going to go in and do nothing and observe and then be present with whatever arises. And that, when, when someone can take that kind of attitude, that is what helps them move beyond what I would identify as a more dualistic level of engagement with entheogens, where, look, if I'm going to an experience saying, well, I want to deal with my relationship with my wife, well, that's dualistic, right? Because then there's me, and there's my wife, and there's the relationship between the two of us and how we're relating. That's dealing with things at a dualistic level, where there's still a separation between me and who I think this other person is over here. The more someone can move themselves into the energetic stance of doing nothing, with no attachments, with no objective, then they're able to move into the non-dual state where their ego is able to dissolve fully within the experience and then there's no more dualities, there's no more separation between self and other. And that's what helps reveal the ultimate nature of being, which is non-dual, where there is no separation, where the, there's no one else there. It's all the self, or we could call it the Buddha mind or the Godhead, or, um, you know, lots of different names for it uh, from different traditions. Um, but for me, that's really the heart of the experience. So that's what I'm most interested in, is how entheogens can help people uncover the non-dual nature of being that is the fundamental ground of reality. Because everything else is just surface play at a dualistic level. And so for me, that's not the most interesting aspect. It's, it's the non-dual that I think is the most significant. And that's the most healing and liberating for people as well. Right. And switching gears uh, just a little bit, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, like, in terms of the quality of uh, these entheogenics of plants, there's, uh, you know, there's all kinds of websites selling stuff and people going to Peru, for example, for Ayahuasca or even here in the States or Europe, there's all kinds of uh, uh, plants, medicine, uh, you know, mushrooms, all kinds of things available these days. But uh, what do you have to say about the quality of the actual plant or substance and how much does it, uh, you know, does that have to do with the experience people go through? And what do you recommend people uh, who want to go through such experiences? Okay, well, wow. there's a number of related questions there. Um, maybe we'll start with, with quality. Um, well, there it really depends on, on what we're talking about, for example. So... Like if we take something like salvia divinorum, salvia divinorum doesn't grow from seed. Every, all salvia divinorum comes from cuttings. And so essentially all salvia div divinorum is biologically identical at this point because there, there are no new salvia plants. Um, so in that sense, if someone wanted to work with salvia divinorum, it doesn't really matter where you get it from. It's all identical, um, most likely genetically identical, that it's no matter where you get it from in the world, it's exactly the same. Now, beyond that, there's ways that people enhance salvia divinorum, and so some people are maybe better at enhancing the leaf than others, and that's where you take salvinorin A and you extract it from the plant, and then you add that back to the leaf material. The advantage of that, for example, if you're working with salvia, is if you're just working with regular salvia leaf, and if you're smoking it, you have to smoke quite a bit in order to get the full effect of salvia. And it can be rather difficult because a lot of people approach it like they're smoking pot or something where, you know, they, they take a hit and then, mm, okay, and then take another hit. Salvia doesn't work that way. If you want salvia to work, if you're smoking it, 
You have to smoke it, 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 and then it happens. Now, if you're working with enhanced leaf, you can take one or two hits, and then you have a full experience. Um, so there's a lot of variability there in terms of how much people are enhancing it or not. Now, if we're dealing with something like mushrooms, different species of psilocybin mushrooms are very different in terms of what the percentage of psilocin and psilocybin are within the mushroom themselves. So some species are very strong, others are very weak. So, you know, sometimes people say, oh, five grams of mushrooms, that's a heroic dose of mushrooms. Well, it really depends on what species you're talking about, and it also depends on that batch itself, that for a really weak batch of mushrooms, five grams might still seem very weak. For a very strong batch of mushrooms, it might seem much more than heroic. It might seem, you know, epically epic in terms of your experience. So there's just so much variety and variability there. Um, I've been dealing with things like ayahuasca. I mean, certainly now ayahuasca tourism is very popular. A lot of people are traveling down to South America. Um, and here again, there's so much variability that different cultures have different ways that they brew ayahuasca. There's different admixtures that you can put into ayahuasca, such as toei. Um, some ayahuascas... Uh, are more on the NNDMT side. Others have more 5-MeO DMT in them. So it really varies a lot. And the providers, the practitioners, also vary really, really widely. And certainly I would say any kind of context where you're taking a medicine with someone else, with some kind of provider, that you, as the person searching that out, I would advise people to get to know the people that you're proposing to work with first because the energy of the person running the show can have a really big impact on someone's experience. And so if there's something there that you feel is not right or that you don't enjoy about someone, that it can make a very big difference. And you know, some people um, get very devoted to their quote-unquote shaman that oh this person I really really love and you know I my advice is for people to stay away from devotion to anyone or anything um, that that tends to be an ego trap for the most part but it is important that you feel safe that you feel comfortable that you feel that you can trust the person providing it because if, if there's any lack of trust on your part then you're not going to be able to surrender fully. And if you're not going to be able to surrender fully, then it's going to be much more challenging and it's going to be much less rewarding for you. So mm -hmm. finding a context where you feel comfortable, and it doesn't mean that you need to appease yourself, that you need to baby yourself or coddle yourself. Uh, challenging yourself is good. But sitting down with someone that you really don't like and that you have no respect for and then taking medicine with them, that's just not a good recipe, I think. So there's right. a lot of, there's just so many variables there. So it really depends on what kind of medicine someone wants to work with, what they're willing to do, if they want to do that at home, or if they want to do that in a shamanic setting, or a new age setting, or a church setting. There's so many variables. Um, and that's part of what's interesting about the field, is that there are all these different variables. And of course, you know, there's all the research chemicals. Um, all the synthetics and things like that and so people are getting those off the internet and you never really know what you're getting so if that's a course that someone wants to go it's best to find a, a place that you know that you can trust but even then you how do you really know I mean a lot of these are places in India or China so we, we don't really know wh what we're getting if you're gonna order from something like that right right so, uh, a lot of variables yeah, that's true. A lot of research, and that's where the power of the internet comes into play. I, I, I feel that because of the internet, it's both ways. It's it has the pros and cons. You can get anything you want, any information you want, or even any substance you want. But there's also the negative side of it. You know, people uh, scamming people. You know. Even uh, even if people decide to go to Peru, for example, there's people sh uh, sh who call themselves shamans, but they are just after your money, and there's so many 
stories of uh, people, you know, losing everything and not getting any good experience. So uh, I feel, yeah, a lot of research is needed uh, by whoever wants to do it, and it's. It's and also I think it builds more confidence when you actually do the experience and if you already have that information in your mind you are more confident and you're not scared that you know oh what's going to happen you already kind of have an idea that you know this person is like this and the experience is going to be like this uh, you know you don't just freak out and <laughs> start running naked <laughs> like people do on alcohol sometimes but. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but switching gear a little bit more to the DMT, uh, I I know you you've done a lot of research and experiments on on DMT, and also you hold sessions uh, uh, with people about that. Uh, I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what are the different kinds of DMT and what? How is it different from other entheogenics, and what can people expect? out of uh, DMT experience. Okay, well, DMT is a tryptamine, so it's dimethyl tryptamine, and it's really a basic um, chemical structure, which is known as the indole alkaloid, um, and there's a, just a tryptamine base, and then there's a lot of varieties by... Uh, you know, you add a little something here or take a little something away here, and so you, there's there's many, many different kinds of tryptamines. Um, DMT is kind of the base molecule for a lot of these. So, for example, if someone is working with psilocybin mushrooms, um, psilocybin and psilocin are both basically DMT molecules that have a little something extra attached to them. And because they have that little something extra attached to them, it makes it possible for someone to eat a psilocybin mushroom and receive effects from that. Whereas if you were to eat something that just had DMT in it, there's not going to be any reaction because you have enzymes in your stomach that are going to break down the DMT. Uh, one of the fascinating things about these tryptamine molecules is that they seem to be rather ubiquitous throughout nature. So in, in the human being, and actually in all mammals, um, our main neurotransmitters are also all tryptamines. So they're in, they're in the same family as DMT. And in fact, human beings produce small amounts of both DMT and 5-MeO-DMT, and also bufotenine, which is 4-OH-DMT, I believe. Um, so this is a whole class of tryptamine molecules and for example if someone's working with ayahuasca most commonly the active visionary agent within that is DMT now like I mentioned before that there are you know there's a lot of cultures in South America and some of them use wide varieties of ayahuasca and so some of them are more geared towards 5-MeO DMT than they are to NN DMT but usually when people say DMT what they're talking about is NN DMT so it's a DMT with two nitrogens on it also within that same family would be 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine or 5-MeO DMT and this is NN DMT that has a 5-methoxy group that is attached to it. So it's again, it's the same base molecule and it just has this little bit of something different on it. And it produces a very, very different experience. So these days many people are very interested in DMT. It's, it's kind of the hot molecule. Everybody loves DMT. Uh, it really received a, a lot of press, um, I would say primarily from Terence McKenna and then also via Rick Strassman Rick and his Strassman. book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And, and the documentary by Schultz, what's his name, Mark Schultz? Yeah, uh, Mitch Schultz, Mitch which is, Schultz, of course, yeah. that, that's much more recent. Um, right. So that's kind of, Mitch made that movie based on the interest and excitement that was already there around yeah. DMT because of Strassman's work and also because Terrence McKenna liked to talk about DMT a lot. 
-hmm. And so for, for many people in the modern countercultural, new age, neo-shamanic movement that DMT is kind of considered to be the, the ultimate experience, the pinnacle molecule, that's something that I personally really disagree with. I think 5-MeO-DMT is far more interesting and far more powerful and far more relevant. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of hype about DMT. I would also say there's a lot of mythology that's been built up around DMT. There's a lot of speculation that people, I would characterize them as indulging in with DMT. Like just earlier today, you know, I'm cruising through Facebook and there is yet another post about does DMT launch us into a parallel universe? So this has all been this speculation that's come around since Terrence McKenna and Rick Strassman. And yeah. it's something that I personally think is just total nonsense. I think it's completely irrelevant. It's just speculative. And it's not what the experience is actually about. Even though it might seem like that, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I've argued that that's not what that's not what's going on within the experience at all. But that's kind of the mythology that people talk about. Oh, DMT, it's going to activate your pineal gland, and you're going to have an out-of-body experience, and you'll see aliens, and you'll go into a parallel dimension. Um, and this all comes from the fact that DMT is energetically extremely powerful, and visually, it's very very powerful. So it's probably the most visually oriented of all the entheogens, that DMT is kind of through the roof on the visual level. And for some people, that visual aspect um, can really construct itself into fully made scenes with characters and environment and situations. And so it can seem very real in that sense. It can seem very solid. Um, it's also just at the visual level, I would describe it as kind of high definition neon. It's very bright often. Uh, colors are extremely vibrant, very rich fractal content. So it's extremely, extremely visual. Now what you're getting in ayahuasca is of course it's a version of, of DMT and so ayahuasca is known to be a very visual medicine. Um, and it's not all the time. It, but the stronger it gets, the more visual it becomes. The more DMT is in ayahuasca, the more visual the experience is. And it can certainly be profoundly beautiful in terms of the, the visual content and the fractals and the geometry. And it can also have all kinds of just odd imagery that arises for people, insects, aliens, things morphing into one another, um, Things like architecture are very common as well. Uh, works of art, statues, all kinds of things. Technology, um, computers, circuitry, um, all kinds of things show up. In and death too, I guess. Death is another uh, experience that sometimes people go through, right? Yeah, it tends to be a bit rarer, um, but it certainly can happen where people feel themselves as dying. So for example, a, a paper that I wrote some years ago now is called Digesting the Spirit Molecule. And what I've done in that paper, and this is also a, a podcast episode that I did, is I took the experiences that were recounted in the film, DMT, the Spirit Molecule, and I started with the most dualistic experience and then went through the spectrum to the most non-dual experience that an individual had uh, that as they were recounted within the film. And when we get to the non-dual side of things, that's when people start to have experiences that they interpret as death. Because from the ego's perspective, when the ego is dissolving, and when it's really letting go and all the structures of the ego are kind of falling away, from the perspective of the ego, it thinks it's dying. It says, oh my god, this is it. I'm going to, I'm dissolving, I'm disappearing, and I'm yeah. never coming back from this. Mm -hmm. And so many people interpret that as mm -hmm. the experience of dying. Now, even within that, there's a choice, because the ego can say, hey, I'm dying, okay, let's let it happen. And in that case, the ego falls away, and then a person goes into a non-dual state of awareness. So for example, in the film, I forget the individual's name who describes this, but he says that um, 
everything appeared as this golden white light and the white light was God and that it was also him at the same time and there was no distinctions, no separations. That's the non-dual experience where he actually goes all the way into the full nature of himself. But it doesn't last for very long. And so that's the thing if, if you're smoking DMT or if you're vaporizing it, it's a very brief experience. It only lasts for 10 to maybe 15, 20 minutes at the very longest. Whereas if you're taking it in the form of ayahuasca, it's going to be several hours long. So it's a much slower buildup and then it's a much slower come down. Whereas if you're smoking or vaporizing DMT, it's nearly instantaneous. As soon as you pass a, a threshold level, it's just instantly everything transforms into this hyper real DMT state. So there's this wide variety of more dualistic experiences where the ego is holding on and projecting and has attachments and is struggling to maintain a sense of identity. And then the death experience is when someone fully lets go within that. Now, a far more effective molecule for entering into the non-dual state and having that death experience would be 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine or 5-MeO-DMT. Um, in my experience, people are far more likely to hold on with their ego while experiencing DMT than they are in experiencing 5-MeO DMT. So for me, that makes it a far more interesting molecule because the non-dual state is the fundamental ground of being. That is the most basic level of reality that we can experience where there is no sense of separation. And the fact that 5-MeO makes that much more likely for a person to experience, for me that makes it a much more interesting molecule. Now, by comparison to DMT, 5-MeO DMT is comparatively much less visual. Now, it can be very visual, but when it is visual, it's more like a pure white light that is shining through a very complex uh, prism. So it kind of fractals out into these beautiful white rainbow, very luminescent, whereas, again, DMT is kind of like hyper neon high definition. So visually, they're very, very different from each other, though they both present as tryptamines. Mm -hmm. But more significant than any kind of visual content is that 5-MeO-DMT is energetically so very powerful that it makes it much more likely that the ego will just give up. Whereas within the DMT experience, it's very easy for the ego to hold on. And even though the person might forget who they are or where they are, any kind of visionary content where there's beings or landscapes or environments or anything like that, that's still a dualistic experience that is still being filtered through the structure of the ego because there's still a sense of self and there's a sense of other within the experience where this says, well, this is me over here, and I'm experiencing some entity that's outside of me that's over here. That's a dualistic experience. So that's still being processed through the ego. Whereas with 5-MeO DMT, when it opens up all the way, there's no content. It's just the unitary state. There's nothing there. So for some people, that makes it much more terrifying. For example, Terrence McKenna, he didn't like 5-MeO-DMT. He really liked DMT, and that's because he was attached to certain projections of his ego, namely the machine elves. He really liked that. He liked hallucinating. Whereas with 5-MeO-DMT, when you move beyond all visual content, there's this vast ocean of unitary awareness and infinite energy that is the true nature of being. And all Terence McKenna had to say about that was, well, it's a feeling. And then he said, but DMT is so much more interesting because I see all this interesting stuff. So that's just a clear reflection that he's much more attached to his ego, that he wants to see stuff. So the 5-MeO DMT experience can be both the most rewarding and also most the the most challenging experience for people because to really let go into it you have to be willing to die. Now you're not actually going to die but it will sure seem like it in the moment and if you can face that moment of death 
and embrace it and surrender and say, yes, I want to allow this to happen, then it's the most profound experience anyone can ever have. You literally, you cannot really describe it. You cannot understand it because it's, it's too paradoxical to be understood. But it can be experienced directly and it is profound and for most people it's not an experience that they've had that you know I, I've spoken with lots of people who have worked with psychedelics and entheogens maybe their whole lives and very few of them can actually say well I've had a fully non-dual experience in which there was no sense of self and no sense of other and it was just a universal ocean of awareness without any content but it's, a, it's actually a very rare experience and within the history of religions for example, in Buddhism and Hinduism, this is the kind of experience that they're aspiring towards. And it's considered to be very rare within those traditions that anyone would ever actually experience that. Like within Buddhism, they say, well, many lifetimes down the road, you might have this experience. Like even in Dzogchen, in Tibetan Buddhism, they say, well, this is the most accelerated path, and so you might experience this in the next five to ten lifetimes. Probably won't be this one, but maybe five or ten down the road you can have this. So it's considered to be very rare to actually have a full non-dual mystical experience. But as part of the wonder of 5-MeO-DMT is that it makes it much more accessible to people. It makes it possible for people to have it and make it accessible in a way that might not otherwise be accessible to people. Yeah, and of course uh, we have to mention uh, the legal aspects of it. Uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the legality in the United States and other countries of DMT and other such entheogens? Yeah, well, this is an area that is currently undergoing a lot of changes. Um, so it's an interesting area. Sometimes it changes for the good, sometimes it changes for the bad. So DMT has been illegal in the United States and pretty much around the world since the mid-1970s. I believe that there is a a treaty signed in the United Nations about drug enforcement and the United States signed on to that and so in the, the in the United States DMT became a schedule 1 illegal substance in the 1970s. I believe could be wrong on that, but it's certainly been a while um since at least the time that I was a child if not before then. Um 5MeO DMT for some mysterious reason that no one can really pinpoint why, that was scheduled as an illegal sch Schedule One substance by the U.S. Congress on January 19th of 2011, so relatively recently, and it's not really clear why they felt that was something that they needed to do. Um, there are no cases of people overdosing. It's certainly not widely used. It's something that most people have never even heard of. So it's kind of a curious event of well, why did Congress suddenly decide that they wanted to make 5-MeO DMT illegal. But for whatever reason, they did. So that was in 2011, so just a few years ago now. Um, currently, 5-MeO DMT is still legal in Canada and in Mexico, so on both sides of the border of the United States. And so you interviewed Octavio, so you know that now there are clinics opening up in Mexico where they're using 5-MeO DMT to help treat people who are suffering from addictions. Right. Um, and it's also happening in Canada as well. So it's kind of interesting that the United States decided to make this illegal around the same time that it's starting to find um, clinical and medicinal uses within cultures. Mm -hmm. um, also, 5-MeO-DMT has been used as a psychedelic snuff by indigenous cultures in Central America and also in ayahuasca in South America, and DMT as well. So for many indigenous cultures, in Central and South America, they have had their religious rights to use these substances protected by law. Not, not in all countries in South America, but certainly in many of them, it has been legally recognized. And also in Brazil, there are several syncretic religious churches that have developed over the past centuries, such as the um, Unio do Vegetal and the Santo Daime, 
in Barkina, and they've also had their religious right to use ayahuasca beverages protected. Um, here in the United States, ayahuasca is largely illegal. Um, Except for Santo Daimis using it, right? Yeah. yeah, so we do have a couple of uh, exceptions. Um, there's the Santo Daime Church here in Ashland, Oregon, where they sued the federal government under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to be able to drink daime within their church, and they won. But that court case, one of the um, restrictions that was put on that court case was that the decision, even though it was being decided in federal court, the decision would only apply to churches in Oregon. So currently, today, you can go to a Santo Daime church in Oregon and you can drink Daime and that is both protected by state law and by federal law. Now, if you drink Daime in any other state in the United States, that's a felony offense for consuming a Schedule One substance and you can go to prison. But not in Oregon, so it's a little bit unique here in Oregon. But uh, that's now, now I know why you live in Oregon. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when I moved here, I, I didn't even know that the Santo Daime Church was here. And it's interesting because when I moved here, it was right when they first started taking that case to court. And mm, I, was wow, attending the, I was attending the church mm, at the time, so that was kind of mm, that was the big thing yeah, that right. was going on within the church was uh, mm. this big court case. And, and then they won, so it was quite the celebration. Mm -hmm. um, but they had already had it recognized by the state, which is also interesting. They were kind of proactive in that, that the church went to the authorities within the state and said, hello, we are using a Schedule One illegal substance within our church ceremonies, and we'd like to have that protected as religious freedom within the state. And the state agreed. So the state had already recognized that they had a religious right to that, but they had been raided by uh, federal officers. And so that's why they decided to, to take it to federal court. Um, and now there are many Santo Daime churches throughout the United States. They are not just in Oregon. Um, but any of those other churches, that would be considered illegal activity. Another exception is the Unio do Vegetal, which is another religion that comes from Brazil. Mm -hmm. And a church of the UDV in New Mexico they also went to court, and their case ended all the way up at the Supreme Court. And they basically got their right to drink, they call it Waska, mm -hmm. within their church. They can drink Waska, but the, the UDV is a much smaller religious organization. So um, there's many more people practicing Santo Daime in the United States and around the world than there are people who are involved in the Unio do Vegetal. Um, so that court case really only applied to a very small number of people, whereas the Santo Daime is potentially much larger. Now there's also lots of ayahuasca that goes on within the United States. And it's interesting because it seems like the federal government has mostly turned a blind eye towards ayahuasca. So here in southern Oregon, I'm amazed at how much ayahuasca is served here in the local community that if, if someone wanted to drink ayahuasca you you would easily if you met the right people you could easily have ayahuasca probably every weekend if that's what you wanted to do that there's right. that much ayahuasca going on here and that's from local practitioners as well as practitioners who are being flown in from South America to come and lead ceremony. And for many people here in Oregon, it's also connected with the Native American church, which uses peyote. So a lot of people who sit in ayahuasca ceremony are also involved in the Native American church, uh, which also is legally protected and recognized here in Oregon and in the United States. Though again, it's different in Oregon, that in Oregon, the Oregon state law says anyone can legally participate in a Native American church ceremony. In many places in the United States, you must be a Native American to legally participate in a Native American church ceremony. So it's one of the only racially 
biased religious laws in the United States that says, well, if you're Native American, you, you can eat peyote for religious purposes, but any other race of person may not, that they're breaking the law. So it's a very muddy, really messed up um, system of, of laws because it, there's racial biases, there are religious biases. Um, I find, personally, I find it very ironic that the Santo Daime Church is now legally protected, but ayahuasca shamanism is not legally protected, which is far more ancient. It's much, much older. People have been practicing ayahuasca for many hundreds, if not many thousands of years longer than anyone's been practicing Santo Daime. But part of that is because the Santo Daime, they brought the court case. But no one in Oregon has stepped up and said, hey, I want to have my religious right to drink ayahuasca protected. And even there it's questionable whether that would be recognized because the courts in general do not see shamanism as a religious practice. They see it as a cultural practice but not something worthy of uh, constitutional protection as a religious exercise. Right, right. And not to mention that we as human beings uh, you know, we shouldn't be told what to do in the sense it's good to have a law. Uh, and also not to mention that alcohol, which is the biggest uh, drug in the world right now, I think, and also addictive, is legal everywhere. And then we are told, you know, not to have plant medicines. That itself is kind of ridiculous. Uh, but I guess that's how the law works. They, they you know, they don't see the value out of it. They <laughs> probably see the, you know, the money that they can make, the taxes, the control they can have over people by having these uh, laws. Uh, moving on to a different topic, I just, I wanted to know, uh, and also I wanted our audience to know a little bit more about what you're currently doing, and also why don't you mention uh, something about the books you've written and how people can get started if they want to have, uh, if they want to know more about uh, the plants and the stuff that you're doing. How, where do they start and what you're currently doing and what are your future plans? Okay. Um, well, if someone's interested in the work that I do and the information that I put out, Probably a good place to start is on my podcast. It's called the Entheogenic Evolution Podcast, and I've been putting that out for about six or seven years. Now I'm not entirely certain how long it's been. And there's kind of two sides to the podcast. There are kind of lectures that I've given, so it's just me, and that's presenting my view and my understanding, um, which many people find very challenging because I am... I do not take a spiritual approach, which many people would like me to take a spiritual approach, but I don't. Um, so a lot of people find that very challenging. Um, and then the, the other side of my podcast is interviews that I do. And I'm, I tend to be very selective at this point about who I interview on my podcast. Because in, in my view, a lot of the information that's out there currently particularly within sort of the neo-shamanic, new age, psychedelic circles, I think a lot of it is just ego projection and attachment. I think a lot of it is indulgent and profoundly incorrect in many ways. So I'm very careful about who I have on my podcast because I do not want to be promoting those views on my podcast. So mostly I find people who have something that they can say about the non-dual perspective and the non-dual take. Um, so just to generally describe it, many people are, are approach entheogens from what I would call a shamanic perspective, or, or even better would be a neo-shamanic perspective, which is very dualistic. The non-dual approach is very, very different, and so that's what I try and promote on my podcast. Because for me, that's much deeper, that the shamanic experience for me is a surface level experience. It's the non-dual is the core. So that's really what I, I want to communicate to people. I've also sort of articulated this and I've given it a name which you mentioned at the top of the podcast or, or the, the top of this broadcast which is the entheological paradigm. And the reason why I've given a name to the view that I'm articulating is because it's not a shamanic 
approach, and so I want to distinguish it from a shamanic approach. It's not a neo-shamanic approach, but it's also different than the non-duality that we might see articulated within Hinduism or Buddhism or Taoism, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and all of this, for me, it comes out of my own direct experience. So I've given it a name, and I didn't want it to just be called Martinism or something like that, because I just <laughs> that sounds really silly. So that's why I call it the entheological paradigm. So it's the paradigm or the model of the understanding of God within, which is what the word um, entheological comes from entheogen, which means generating the experience of God within. So this is the logic of God within, the paradigm of the logic of God within. I have also have a, a web page um, specifically for the entheological paradigm, and it's entheological-paradigm.net, so people can check out my views there. And then I also have a channel on YouTube called, um, it's just the Entheogenic Evolution on YouTube, and that's where I post videos has a lot of my fractal art and music over there, as well as some interviews from my podcast. So those are various ways that people can get uh, and, and find and your, information. And your books, on your books, uh, of course. Yeah, and so the, the next way would be the books. Um, I write both fiction and nonfiction, so I have a variety of novels that are available, which are all about this topic. Um, my most recent novel is called Beyond Azara, a universal love story. And it's basically a novel about ayahuasca and 5-MeO-DMT set within a fictional fantasy context. As far as I know, it's the only novel in the world that's actually about 5-MeO-DMT. It starts on page one with a 5-MeO-DMT experience, so it starts off with a bang. And then my nonfiction books, um, my early books would be Mushroom Wisdom, and Sage Spirit. Mushroom Wisdom obviously was about psilocybin mushrooms. And then I wrote a book about Salvia Divinorum called Sage Spirit. Uh, another book that came after that was uh, a book uh, called The uh, Entheogenic Evolution. I named it after my podcast. That book is currently out of print, so good luck finding that. Some people still do, I guess. But um, that's what been about, out of print. Do you have them as PDFs too, or just a print? Um, they're available as PDF, as Kindle, as paperback. Um, my books are available in the iBook store, so they're, they're really easy to find. Oh. Then more recently, the books... Now, if someone wants to start with an overview of the entheological paradigm, the best place to start is my book, Being Human, An Entheological Guide to God, Evolution, and the Fractal Energetic Nature of Reality. It's a very short book, mm -hmm. and that comes for me... I went through a very profound process of awakening and transformation, and that was the first book that I wrote subsequent to that, is Being Human. So that's a place that I generally recommend people start if they're interested in, in my experiences and my views. After that, I published a book called The Entheological Paradigm, Essays on the DMT and 5-MeO DMT Experience and the Meaning of It All. And that's actually a collection of essays, so it's not written as a book, it's just different articles that I had written and put together into one package. Um, uh, recently I have a a short ebook, it's kind of a mini ebook, and it's called All is One, Understanding Entheogens and Non-Duality, and I made that available just as an online ebook, something that people can download. And then most recently, I have published a memoir called Being Infinite, an Theogenic Odyssey into the Limitless Eternal, a memoir from ayahuasca to Zen. And that really is the book that describes my own process and my own experiences and how I came to the view that I have now, which is, again, I describe as the entheological paradigm and kind of detailing the process of what I went through in order to arrive at this position that I now have. Um, and so, all, yeah, like I mentioned, all of these are available as paperback or as downloads and ebooks and, and PDFs, and they can be ordered directly from my webpage or Amazon or the iBookstore, wherever books are sold. Not in bookstores, though, because they're self-published, so you won't find them in a bookstore. Right, and what about the sessions or work that you do directly with people? Well, I will just say that there's not too much that I can say about that just for, for various reasons, but I will say that I work with people individually, one-on-one, -on -one, to help them 
overcome the blocks of their ego and realize non-duality for themselves. And, and that's really my focus. And I only work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and honestly, if people are, are interested in learning more about that, uh, my recommendation is to read my novel, Beyond Azara, because actually a large content of the book is based on the work that I do with people, and it's presented in a fictional format to make it a accessible to people that way. Um, I, I really wish there were more that I could say publicly about the work that I do, but just because yeah. of various concerns that yeah. it's not, it's unfortunately it's something that I, I it, it's, it's a tough decision for me because for me honesty is the most important thing and to be upfront and to not edit or to censor yeah. yourself. So sometimes I kind of cross the line, maybe, I don't know if there is a line, um, but I do try and be aware of what I'm saying publicly about the work that I do. Right. Um, but I will say that the, the people who work with me tend to find it to be the most, the most profound work that they've done. And so for me that's gratifying. And also it's something that utilizes me to the utmost of my personal capacity. So in that sense it's very gratifying for me right. to be able you know, it's like if you have someone who's a marathon runner, they really want to run a marathon. They want to do that. They want to push themselves to the limit and succeed. And so for me, that's what sessions are like in a sense. Okay, great, Martin. Uh, before we end the discussion, is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? Anything about your future plans or anything else? Yeah, okay. Well, we can have future plans. Uh, you know, I never really know too much about the future in the sense that um, personally I tend to stay focused on the present <laughs> to some degree mm -hmm. and you know people always ask me well when are you gonna write the next book or what's what's the new book gonna be about or are you gonna write a new novel or what are you gonna do and I usually don't know and then when I get the idea then I sit down and I do it and I tend to do things pretty quickly so at the moment I don't have any plans for any books I just released my memoir um, kind of late in the spring of this year so that's still relatively new I'm not really looking to write anything right now mostly I've been focusing uh, just locally here in the southern Oregon area uh, I organized a series of lectures all summer long uh, at various local festivals bringing in people speaking about psychedelics and entheogens so that's been a big thing that I've been working on um, also, we had our very first conference about psychedelics at Southern Oregon University that I helped organize this past spring. We're going to do another one in 2015 in the spring. And I'm also, uh, just the other day, met with someone who runs kind of the largest venue here in Ashland is the Ashland Armory where they're having concerts and light shows and things like that. And they're very interested in putting on a three-day event about entheogens that will involve speakers, academics, science, uh, laser light shows and projections, bands, DJs, visionary artists, things like that. So that'll be coming up um, next spring. I'm always looking for places to go out and give talks or give interviews like we're doing now. And mainly what I do, what takes up most of my time right now, for one, is just raising my son, Jaden. Mm -hmm. um, I teach at the local university. I'm still on summer. I have three weeks left, and then I go back to teaching. I teach religion at the university. Mm -hmm. And um, then I fill the rest of my time with making music and making fractal art. And locally here in Southern Oregon, I try and play out as much as I can. Just had a gig last night, and I show art. So I've, I have two art shows going right now. I have another one that's going to be going up um, in Medford in a month from now at a place called Art Du Jour. Um, so I like showing art, I like playing music, I like giving talks. And most of that is all very local, so don't get around too much. Uh, mostly just here in Southern Oregon kind of doing my thing. And most days, I mean sometimes people think, oh man, you must be doing medicine like all the time and just sitting around <laughs> tripping all the time. And you know, honestly, most of the time I'm just sitting here in front of my computer either recording music or playing with fractals and I, I lead a very ordinary existence in, in that sense. 
Yeah, which is different kind of trip. I guess everything is a trip. <laughs> Being yes. in front of the computer is a trip too because we are getting into virtual reality kind of. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Martin. It was a great conversation. I learned a lot of good things, and uh, I hope to make it to Ashland someday and attend one of your events. Uh, and appreciate all the work you're doing. And again, Martin's uh, website is uh, martinball.net, and he also has a podcast uh, link on his website. And our website is soulfreedom.org. Uh, it's Lokesh Baba from the Soul Freedom Show. Uh, thanks, Martin, once again for joining us again, uh, joining us here. And uh, we hope to see you all again soon with the next uh, discussion uh, with the next guest. Thank all you right. all, and thanks, Martin. Bye bye. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.